would have waited an eternity for this. It's over, Prime. Welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. I am Chris Merman, and I am joined today by my fellow board members. I am joined by uh, Jay Hirschko. Jay, what's up? How's it going? And Andrew Leff. What's up, Andrew? What's going on? <laughs> Andrew uh, is, is more chill than usual. So uh, <laughs> we are joined today by uh, not, someone, not just someone that I respect, someone that one of the first Agile books that I read uh, when we started talking about transformation, I thought, hey, do you think maybe we could get uh, this guy on? Uh, mainly just because I like talking to him. And also, he has uh, a public vendetta against uh, Ryan Lockard. So I thought we could <laughs> let him air his grievances against Ryan Lockard. So, Jason Little, uh, <laughs> welcome to the Agile Uprising podcast. <laughs> Thanks. What's up, guys? Um, do, would you, do, you, do you have any words for Ryan Lockard if he's, if he's listening in the world? Well, the, originally it was supposed to be to, to dye his hair orange, but that's not going to work. So uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, we will settle for the beard. Okay. so he's but, supposed it, to... would it, but it would have to be blue because we'd have to use the oiler blue instead of the oiler orange. So dyeing his beard oiler blue, that's the, the gauntlet has been thrown down. <laughs> now, we... We know Ryan Locker to be a Welch and someone that runs from conflict. So um, I I can't say that we can promise that it'll happen, but um, I do have, I do have uh, contact with his wife and I can, uh, in, in, you know, in a positive way, right. Then I I can make her make him do it. And then we can uh, maybe post it to Instagram or something. I, did I make that sound as awkward as possible, guys? <laughs> Just keep going, keep going. Yeah. Just okay. keep going. All right. Yeah. Uh, so for those that, that do not know Jason, uh, I will I will let him I will let him intro himself in a second. But uh, for for those that haven't read his work, he he wrote several years ago, Lean Change Management, which had a profound impact on on me and how I saw the way that change happens. Uh, the 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 his blog posts and, and the, he, he makes reference to it in the book is this idea of, well, you need to remodel a room in your house. And when you, you, you kind of have an idea of the number of, you know, the amount of materials, the amount of time, but you start pulling walls down, you start, you know, floors. you didn't realize it was there. Um, so you realize you plan just enough to get started and then you get moving. And I, and I use that Jason, that line of, you plan just enough to get started and then you get moving um, with every single client I use. And uh, I know I sound like a fanboy here, but I, I don't care. I, I'm, I'm really appreciative of your work and um, I, I'm, I'm glad you wrote it. So how, how would you, how would you introduce yourself to, uh, to someone that doesn't know your work today? Wow. I, I, I'd use that one, but that sounded, okay. per, that sounded pretty good. Um, <laughs> I think I, uh, Starting off in IT and moving into programming and into management, um, working for startups, uh, naturally primed me to fall into this change work. Uh, So I think having come from a space of having change inflicted on me through various acquisitions and reorganizations and stuff like that, you just, you you start to feel what it's like. And I think a lot of uh, coach consultant folks have forgotten what it's like to be an employee in a company with stuff being forced on you. And uh, it just, it just brings a whole different perspective. And um, it's funny. I was having a conversation with somebody about this, just how uh, when you start to dig a little bit deeper about how you grew up and early jobs and things that you had, I always worked in the service industry always. And uh, so, you know, waited tables and worked in walk-up kitchens and this type of stuff. And you just develop this servant attitude uh, over time. And I think that and working at a call center and IT and just this whole helper mentality um, primed my way into thinking of, you know, serving organizations instead of coming in with a, you know, big agile stick. Was that was that a help desk, like an IT help desk that you were you you were answering phones for? Oh yeah, a long time ago. That's what led to getting into programming because we used to use this was for uh, Nortel Networks back in the day when people knew who Nortel Networks were, 
Um, and we had these uh, massive binders that had all our call center routing information in it. And um, myself and another guy, we used, uh, what, uh, what was it? O'Reilly's Website Pro Cold Fusion and Windows NT 3.5 and built a web app with a Microsoft Access database so we could just have a simple lookup table because we were tired of flipping through these big ass binders. And that's what, you know, got me into programming in the first place. Like five people in the audience just fell out of their chairs going, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we, the cool thing was we, we got in trouble because we started to update our, our signatures from our, for our email. Uh, we called ourselves the web foundation cause we were huge wrestling fans. So we wanted to model our, uh, <laughs> our, our two person program team after uh, the heart foundation tag team. Oh, I remember in the middle, our ma the manager was awesome, but one day he just came over. He's like, "Okay, guys, you gotta, you know, you gotta dial it back a little bit." Um, <laughs> so you were the you were you you were the real life IT crowd. Like you were those oh, two totally. guys sitting in there. Like you were you you were just saying a instead of you know instead of their accent, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We used to okay. take we used to take screenshots. You remember those illegal operation errors from Windows ninety five? <laughs> So we t we take screenshots of uh, some of the call center guys their 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 desktop and then we would overlay that on top of it and set it as their background, and we'd unplug their keyboard. So when they would try to do something like oh it's locked up and they'd restart the computer, and then we just sit there and just try not to laugh and they'd be looking around, and they try to type again when it restarted and they're like fuck and they they hit restart again. Yeah we we had a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, now, but now I, I have to ask Jason, which one were you? Were you Brett the Hitman or were you Jim the Anvil? Like, oh, which I, one were I, you? I was, I was Brett the Hitman because the okay. other guy was very much built like Jim uh, the Anvil. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and I got to say, I'm like, I'm totally geeking out over the, the Windows reference because literally <laughs> you could do the same. Like, we used to do that on the server farms running, you know, NT. And we used to put the blue screen of death on the screensaver and then unplug the keyboard. So yeah. they would think the servers would go down. So that's a great story. <laughs> the closest I ever got to that was if you didn't lock your computer when you went to like the bathroom or something, someone would kind of sneak into your computer. And I don't know if you remember that biker fox guy, the guy that was the, the cyclist that was famous for, you know, riding his bike around with rainbow colors on and they would take pictures of him and make that your background. So like <laughs> if, you, if you came back and saw that they say, Oh, you've been biker Fox, which means you forgot to, <laughs> as if that's going to shame you into locking your computer. I'm like, well, okay, whatever. Um, so speaking of speaking of change and kind of being turned on to it early. Right. So part of, Part of your buyer that you write in the book that uh, is kind of part of your story is in 08, you went to a, a, um, uh, an experiential conference that kind of introduced you to more of these change ideas and were in a, um, in a session that literally explained to you what organizational change is like. Mm -hmm. And you were telling me that you never told it over an interview. So I thought um, maybe to kind of trot out that old story. So tell us the story about the star trying to get the Joanna Rothman uh, and, and what the, just kind of set the stage for the audience. Like this was how Jason really experienced what change for an organization was like very early on in his journey. Okay. Um, so I was three months into my first enterprise coaching uh, engagement. So it was 10, 11 years ago, I guess. And uh, one of the coaches I was working with, um, Eric Mead, and he said, you should go to this AYE, amplify your effectiveness with uh, Jerry, Jerry Weinberg, Steve Smith, Esther Derby, Johanna Rothman, and Don Gray, and um, go to the thing that makes you feel the most uncomfortable. And I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. So I signed up and went, and uh, I went to a, a session around the uh, introduction to the Satir change model. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but... Um, yeah, Steve Smith was the guy who was running it, and we're, we, we're sitting in a big circle. This thing's only limited to 74 people and five sessions running at a time. So I think there were, there were probably 40, 40 of us or something like that in the session. And they go around the room and they ask everybody, what, you, you know, what are your thoughts about change? And when he starts it off, he says, okay, we're going to 
this group of people is going to be the status quo. This group of people is going to be the new status quo. This group is going to be chaos. This group is going to be the foreign element, which are some of the components of the, the infamous Satir J curve. And I was in the old status quo group. And our job was to take the star, who was just one randomly selected person, to stay in one corner of the conference room. So he said, whatever you do, that's the status quo. That person can't change. You got to keep them there. That's your job is the status quo. And the new status quo's job was to move him across to the other corner of the conference room. Uh, and this was a massive, massive conference room. Think uh, the big agile conference, main keynote area sized conference room. Oh, wow. So a lot of open space uh, in this thing. And chaos and the foreign element, they just, he, he said, your job is to disrupt. Uh, he said, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's go. So we started getting stuff from the hotel. We physically built a structure to keep him in the corner of the room. We stacked tables on top of each other and hung curtains. And we stole those big comfortable chairs from the hotel lobby and the plants and stuff. And uh, You built a wall. You, yes. you built a wall, America. Yes. We built a wall. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I, that was in my brain before I told the story. I thought, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll say it. I'm yeah. the, I'm, I'm it's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. <laughs> yes, it's going to be yes. the best wall you've ever seen. It's a, the best it's a huge wall. <laughs> yeah. In Colorado. <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah. So, so uh, as, as we're doing that, uh, chaos and the foreign element, they're literally just clapping and singing and banging stuff on walls and making noise. And the new status quo start, starts taking part of the wall down to get at the star, to get them across. So we're trying to keep things up. Starting uh, a fight. They're, they're, and, they're basically starting a fight. We started shoving each other. And then Steve had to put his hands up in the middle and just yell out, all right, stop. And, and, and this is all, you know, uh, change agents that go to this thing. So all these people who should probably know better. And uh, there were a few lessons. Um, one was, you, it doesn't matter how smart you are, you can't control the emotion of change. But then something really cool happened was, I don't know how somebody in the new status quo team found out, but he found out that this, this star was a huge fan of Johanna Rothman. So he went next door to her session and said, hey, can you come over here? Um, and talk to this guy for a bit. And then once the, the star found out, he knocks the wall down and he just goes barreling through to the other side to talk to her. And um, at the time, I didn't think anything of it. But when I was when I wrote the first chapter of the book, I remember uh, Jurgen Apollo was my writing coach and he was helping with reviewing stuff. And he read the, the first first chapter and he's like, this is shit, rewrite it. I'm like, okay. So that, then I wrote this story. I remembered this story and that I remembered, well, you know, we, we have this negative connotation of change that people resist change and, and they go through anger and denial and shock and all these uh, uh, negative things. And for this guy, it was, oh, that's awesome. I don't care how hard it is. I'm going to that side of the room. So there was such a huge motivating factor for this, for the star to get to the other side independent of like he went to that other side independent of what the new status quo was doing he was motivated and I, you say this in your book he was motivated by something that had nothing to do with the new status quo right yeah. and yeah. and nothing the old status quo could stop it yeah. right so yeah. you're you're you said you're three months into your first like you know your first enterprise coaching gig and, and in the book you talk about in more detail just about just how nervous you were being amongst these people kind of mm -hmm. a thing. Like what's, what is that experience like when you, when like, I mean, I'm sure that there were not just light bulbs over your head, but everybody's head, mm -hmm. right? This exercise opens up a lot of eyes. Like what, what did that do to you? Uh, there isn't a week that goes by that I don't think about an experience from that conference and that session. Cause there were so many things it, that, um, just turned my brain on to stuff that just working in an agile way has always felt natural. And yeah. for a lot of people, it's the same thing. I mean, this stuff isn't hard. It's really easy. And you, I know I got locked into this. This is brain dead easy. Why aren't these idiots in this organization doing it? And you kind of get <laughs> into this. I see this with agile coaches today. They go to 10 million meetups and take 5,000 different kinds of training and they get their skills to a level that's eight levels above where the organization is. And it's really frustrating to deal with that gap. And I think I was kind of at that spot. And this experience in that conference was, 
holy shit, there's a lot more going on that I'm not even yeah. tuned into a little bit. Yeah. So that's really interesting in, in the sense of, I feel like after I started to read your books and as well as uh, the other publications you put out, it completely created a, that, a very similar paradigm shift in my coaching at an enterprise level and, and constantly beating myself up in the sense of, this is easy. Why are we overcomplicating it? Like mm -hmm. tenfold, right? Like we're, we're engineer, over engineering everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. To Jason's yeah. point about how, you know, the, the star was a big Johanna Rothman fan. So somebody wittily, you know, they, they came up with a novel solution. They got Johanna Rothman in the room and this person went head first into the change with their motivations. Um, it, may, it made me think of um, Niels, Niels Flagling has a book, Open Space Beta. Where he talks about how there's no such thing as change resistors. There's people who have not been given a, um, who have not been motivated properly to see what's in it for them, based upon where they're coming from, mm -hmm. who, have, who are now empowered to say, I want to be over on the other side of the wall, regardless of what happens, because it's, it, uh, it hits a note for them. And this ties to, you know, that ties to stuff we were talking about before we start recording about the spiral and, you know, different motivators for different people. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I, when I read, <clears throat> when I read Jason's book, I took me away is, okay, if you find the right motivation, the right lever to pull, you can basically get anybody to do anything. And I, yeah, I, and I have a, just a quick question too, and maybe this is for later on or another topic, but I would be interesting to hear one of the things when I'm doing like a lean change management workshop is in a room full, whether they're leaders, stakeholders, or just strategists, it exposes the fact that they don't know a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> So it's almost like controversial to get them, you know, it's nice to get them along, but it's interesting to see how they can't formulate a simple statement or a vision statement and they just can't wrap their head around that type of concept. So I'm not sure if that's unique to me. I would think not, but I'd be curious to hear Jason, how, you know, if you've experienced a lot of that, especially in a room full of leadership. Yeah, it's, they have conversations they normally don't have. Um, it's pretty easy to do something in isolation or, or farm it out to your change people to come up with the perfect one pager or whatever it is. And once they're actually in a room talking about why is this important to the organization, to us, to our people, it gives a drastically different perspective. And the thing with vision is it, it doesn't matter as much if at all nowadays to formulate a strong vision statement because it's when we, I think we all kind of get, what's being said when we want to quote unquote transform. We know we kind of, we want to go east. We don't know exactly where the roads are. We don't need to wordsmith something to death to get people to align to it because there's the false assumption that we create this statement and we send it out in a newsletter and everybody comes along for the ride. Um, it's the conversation that creates it is the important part. And then when they, we get in those conversations, people go, yeah, why the hell are we doing this in the first place? Things are actually yeah. pretty. Yeah. I so you you I, what I feel like you said without saying it is that that like these leaders have so many like they have so much on their plates transforming, which for for all of us that are not just recording this podcast but listening to this podcast like transformation is a big deal to us like we like we have dedicated if not all of our careers, at least a part of it to mm -hmm. transforming the way that we work, like looking at work a different way, making work a different way. It's the fifth or sixth highest, most important thing with my current clients leadership. Like mm -hmm. they've got so many other things to do. So if you can make transformation, a checklist fucking done, like, let's mm -hmm. just go right. Like, Oh, you can make it. Uh, if you do these things were transformed. Great. That means that I can mark this thing done and I can do these other things that I also have to do in my day that are also important. And that's a real, like, that's why the star story matters so much to me because mm -hmm. we can have the new status quo we want, but it does, if we, if we doesn't make, if we don't make it relevant to these folks, they don't care. Like it doesn't really matter to them, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did a session with a, uh, an internal team of a, a, a national um, company I can't say the name of, but one of the largest in this particular region of the world. And 50-some-odd uh, managers, directors, and, and a VP 
talking about their transformation. And it was, well, there's nothing we can do yet because we don't have a, a solid vision from above to execute on. <laughs> and we did this exercise with this uh, a card game that just, uh, just recently uh, released around, if we're talking about transformation, what are the most important dimensions we need to look at right now? for next week, for the next month, for the next quarter. Let's forget the 10-year transformation. Let's just focus on the most important things to do right now in this context. And after the two-day workshop, they realized the vision didn't really matter at all because they're still going to have to figure this out as they go along. And they need to get to a deeper sense of purpose around why they're being asked to do this, not just a what we usually see in corporations, which is a bullet point about why this is important, because that's always from the organization's perspective. I was in a, another private session where the CEO, all he talked about was money. You know, our, 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 our urgency is to increase revenue by 6%. And everything was money, money, money. And he actually said, um, when it came to employee engagement and uh, um, empowerment and work ethic, baseball only has three strikes. Why are we giving people 10? And I was like, what <sighs> the f <laughs> and, and I brought that up in the workshop I did with the, with the people and I said now imagine this imagine you go to a tester on a team and you go okay the urgency for change is to increase revenue by 6% do you think he's going to care if he makes a millionaire a few extra million bucks <laughs> probably not if you frame the message we're transforming because imagine that you're writing the healthcare software that nurses are using to take care of your sick grandma. Like you radically change the conversation when you go to purpose instead of what we normally go to, which is faster, better, cheaper. And faster, better, cheaper is always gonna be a thing. But we have choices. So right. if we're choosing to transform and we're not being congruent about how we're acting and what we're saying, you're gonna get what you're gonna get. You're gonna get process improvement and that's probably okay in some companies just be transparent about that like don't call it a transformation call it a process improvement program somehow it, um, in agile we've shamed process improvement as being evil and horrible but for some companies this might be the best they can do personally i think it's bullshit and it won't really get you the results you want but for some companies maybe that's the best they can do right now but at least give them the choice to be congruent not just shoot a bunch of smoke and mirrors out of people there there's always there's always faster you can always go faster you can always be better and there's always more cheap you know more a, a cheaper way of doing things right so because there's never a cheaper that's why those metrics are never enough yeah I mean, that, that will never be a motivation for someone doing the work yeah. but the one thing about the you know better faster cheaper model and Cusack brings this up all the time. So you have the three, pick two, right? So if you want it better and faster, it's going to be more expensive. Yeah, if you want it, yeah. yeah. So again, everything has a has a pay, there's a a cost associated with with that approach. And I think something that that Jason, you were talking about, and Jay, you were talking about before we started recording. I really think it's the the purpose, right? The connection to the message or to the to the work. If, just like you said, if it's, you know, to make a millionaire some extra dollars, you're not going to go out of your way. But that, that purpose and connection to the work can, can create at least a viral instance of some culture change or culture shift. Mm -hmm. yep. So I don't want to disagree with that, Andrew. But what I want to press on a little bit is because especially it's 2019, there are some companies that are too big to fail. I mean, let's just be honest. Some companies are too big to fail right now. And we work for some of those companies, right, as consultants, right? And so the, the idea of, well, you can have it better and faster, but you can't have it cheaper. Guess what companies have plenty of these days? Money. The, the program that I'm, I'm, I'm helping trying to transform right now, they are, they are tens, not, not, just a, not just like single digit, they are like $50 million over budget for the year, more than $50 million over budget. They have, they are throwing money at this to try to get better and faster. 
and they're at this point in time, they're like, we don't even, we don't even give a shit if it's cheaper. Let's just throw money in this thing. It's almost like a black hole. Let's just keep throwing money at it, see if that'll make it faster. And it's not. So if we're in a position where businesses have plenty of money, better and faster is not enough. We need to do get, more than that. But, but half the time, they don't even have a baseline of how fast they were moving before. So to me, it's I, like all stupid, right? So Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, if you look at, if you look at the reports coming out of the Business Agility Institute where they talk about how – you know, Scrum promises four times productivity. Realistically, you're getting about 1.5. Safe says anywhere between 20 to 50% productivity gains. Realistically, you're looking at somewhere between 5 and 17%, right? So those, the whole do agile, we go better, you know, quick, faster works, pick two, right? Where left was going. I, I, I think there's, we have a whole other episode to go into about that, <clears throat> that false preconceived notion that if you just do this you will get this exponentially faster which we all know that and jason will tell you jason's been doing it the devil is in the details about how you approach that change that you could build all the right tools right call back call blocker and have them come in and have them build all your pipelines it doesn't really matter if there's a cultural change that's needed the, the patterns are the important things to look for there is i don't know if you guys have seen the four stages of disruption um data that hbr has been putting out and mm -hmm. they talk about uh of course it's in a quadrant because that's what sells uh but it's things like <laughs> look at the the canadian banks are what you would call an agalopoly that means a small few control the market so they don't really need to out innovate each other or transform they need to kind of all move at the same speed to protect their whole industry so this four stages of disruption shows things like um, in, in um, durability markets, for example, uh, tires, uh, alcohol, those will always be around because we're always going to need to move stuff from A to B and people are always going to need to get fucked up. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, tires are getting fucked up. I like it. <laughs> is, that, is that the title of this? Is that the title of this? <laughs> <laughs> so sorry to say it that way, but the point is, in the alcohol industry, buying habits will change as as um, people want the craft beer movement in the '80s, for example, when there was a beer store strike in Canada craft breweries started to open up. So people started looking at craft beers and then the big players bought those smaller players. So in these durable markets, there's, it's very unlikely that there will be any type of meaningful transformation because there's always going to be a need for that. Medicine, there's always going to be a need for medicine. Um, so it talks about when you're into things like consumer electronics, they don't really need to transform because they already work that way in the first place because they have to. So it's interesting, you know, throw money at the problem. Yeah, sure. That's no problem because that, that's, their, that's the industry giant's way of coping with market change. Uh, keep an eye on it. Don't necessarily innovate. Make sure you have a stable base. Buy it when it becomes too disruptive. Yeah. So you at least get your piece. And it's unlikely to be something meaningful. Doesn't mean they won't spend millions of dollars on transformation. Um, but for me, I go to a different place of uh, helping people loving coming to work again. The guy uh, at a private thing I did a few weeks ago said, um, you know, he used to teach uh, inner city kids. And uh, one day he said uh, his mentor uh, meets one of the kids at the door and says, hey, you know, what do you, um, How's it going? You know, what'd you have for breakfast? You're ready for school, blah, blah, blah. And the kid hadn't eaten, so he takes the kid to get some food first. And my friend who I did the, the session with said, uh, he asked this guy, well, he's going to be late for class. Why are you doing that? And he said, if this kid's coming to school hungry, his kids are coming to school hungry. Hmm. And wow. the, way, the way that that affects him as a change agent is when he interacts with anybody at work, he is changing their life they're going home as a parent happier if they're happier they're not yelling at their kids their kids are growing up more well adjusted the kids that their kids hang out with are having better relationships he says this is bigger than some stupid process improvement program and we really got to think as change agents what's the important thing for us is it to make a meaningful impact for people or is it to 
you know, write a white paper and become famous. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I hear you. And, and that, so we're, we're, you know, like 30 minutes in already. And I, I, I want to get to like our actual topic, which is <laughs> what, you just, what, you just, what you just talked about. Right. So these, these change, you know, as a change agent, right. So you talked about as a conference, of change agent, you told us a story about this, this new, um, this new way of thinking that was trying to get the star across the way. We talked about like how we try to help see like, so there's this idea of change agents in organizations. Uh, oftentimes as consultants, we get brought in as external change agents, but most of the time these companies have internal folks already trying to, in fact, some of the best transformations I, or at least maybe not successful, but the, the, the ones that I've enjoyed the most have folks advocating for that change within the organization. Mm -hmm. um, so Jason, what in your book, how do you, how do you refer to these, these kind of internal change agents? Uh, what was the, what was the office you were a part of? Uh, the name of our department was the QMO quality management office, which was the worst name for a change team ever. <laughs> Because right. <laughs> it just smells of quality police, which people thought we were. So just by the name, you're guilty of being enforcers. And, yeah, it sounds, uh, like, it sounds like a name for the testing team. Yeah, well, because the, the, our manager was the old QA manager. Uh, there you go. And, and the, our department name was handpicked by the CEO, and I was told not to fight that because that was his pet thing and something he used at a previous thing. And I'm like, well, that's just stupid, but who cares? Let's work with sure. what we got. Sure. Sure. Um, I mean, you can go to Cotter's Eight Steps. Having a guiding coalition is essentially a, a change team. Um, what you call it, I think, only matters if people are looking at your SharePoint site. But once they know the people that are on the team and you have the relationships established, the name doesn't matter as much because I've seen agile change and enablement, transformation team, transformation coaches, uh, yeah. change community, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, the concept... Yeah. My current client, we call them a transformation team. Jay, Jay what's, your, what's your office called? Uh, the, the Agile Value Management Office. All right, you say that with such like, like panache. And, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how like, much I really should share without getting myself hung out to dry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you should be brandishing a rapier while doing that. Uh, <laughs> oh, Andrew, hey. What a, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 you're, you're fine. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask if you printed out the manifesto and made people sign it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's funny you bring, it's funny you bring that up. Because I work somewhere where they did that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking about that, like the membership, right? Like you almost need a membership to do this kind of work to invest in it. it there's something mm -hmm. about becoming a member of doing this type of work. Not that I want to promote being, you know, memberships, but I, I like the idea of the manifesto and having to sign it. You should at yeah, least I, have to read it. <laughs> it's only four lines. Couldn't take long. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, these days, membership means, well, unfortunately, membership these days means getting your SPC, but that's another, that's another. Uh, we're not going to, we're not going to. Yeah. Yeah. No, gonna, no, it, yeah. it used to be, a, it used to be, I'm a coach. I have a CSM, but now, now that's a, that's a different yeah. thing. So, mm. all right. So we, we talked about, so you just mentioned Jason that, they're in Cotter's eight rules of change, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, I guess in your mind, what is the value of having within the organization internal folks that are advocating for change? They're the ones that are actually doing the work and have to live with the consequences. So, you know, the, the idea with the, the having a guiding coalition, it's a universal thing. Um, if we want something to have as much importance as it should have, we have a group of people dedicated to making sure that gets done. Now, how they go about it, obviously, is, is the magic part. So, for example, there's a, a global company that I'm doing some, you know, basically I'm a, like a, a change agent help desk for them. So I am <laughs> behind the scenes, never in the building, never doing anything. They have a, a, a a core transformation team of three people that kind of act as orchestrators, for example. So if you think of the old switchboard operators or the air traffic controllers, they're not creating things and pushing it outwards. They're acting as a, oh, somebody in the UK solved this problem. I'm going to connect you with the people in Spain who are having this problem. 
and let's have a conversation about what practices you did to help that group change and do whatever. So I support the support team that's supporting the 50 global change agents who are actually, some of them are agile coaches, some of them are change consultants, some of them are managers in manufacturing um, that are part of this greater change network. So when designed in a, a, a helpful servant leadership type of way, I, I'm all for it, but I normally see them created as a control center. They're basically created analogous to a PMO to uh, centralize and standardize things mm. um, and govern. And, and that's, I mean, in a, in a big telecom or a bank, that's probably the best you're going to do anyway. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. There are so, different options. So you're, you're, you're the, you're the help desk for these change agents. Are you, are you putting the blue screen of death on their computers as well? <laughs> no, because I'm always at home. I never get. To, I'm never in their offices. If I can get remote access, I probably would. But yeah, no, we meet. Every, we meet every two weeks for Lean Coffee. So they they bring a real problem. We get together. We talk about it. Uh, we 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 help them generate some options to go back into the wild, and then they bring the problem back a couple of weeks later, and we see how it went. I've had virtual lean coffees all the time. So I, I, I love that kind of a thing. So, all right. So, all right. So Andrew, you, mm -hmm. right. So you, you hear this and, and you think what? I, I, I just like literally every time I hear someone else talk in this way, just gives me hope because <laughs> it really feels like, you know, a lot of the work we do is, is to decommission the myth or demystify the myth around agile and agility and what does it mean to truly do organizational change or whatever buzzword you want to call it. It just, it's exhausting to constantly have to undo the bad to get them to even be open to listening to the good. Yeah. Mm. So it's, it's that whole, it's honestly left. I honestly think it's that whole thing about semantic diffusion, right? Where a word is, is used for with, a, with an original, definition and then as time goes on that word goes out into the ecosystem and it starts being defined by different people to mean different things to the point where it's it's almost like semantic collapse right everybody hears agile and devops and they already have a preconceived notion in their head about what that is whether it's right wrong or different they don't necessarily know and i think that's probably a big i i, I think that's probably a big part of our fight right it's just to get to people to understand that it's not it's not scrum, right? It's not sprints. It's more than that. And but I think that's where our, our, our pain comes in. Yeah. And there, there's one other thing that I, I've brought it up a couple times. And, and I think even Jason, you touched on it. I don't know what happens when people leave their house. What changes when they walk through the door of work? Like what mm -hmm. mentally changes in their brain that feels that they can behave in such a different way if they are? in work versus would, would you talk to your kids that way? Would you, would you let someone talk to your kids the way that you're addressing the people mm -hmm. that work for you? It's, it's just to me a very interesting, like it just boggles my mind. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a question for Jason around the idea of this, this transformation office, right? So I think about Einstein who said that you can't solve a problem with the same thing you use to create it, right? So what has been your experience with, you know, team, the groups, organizations, enterprises want to spin up this transformation office and they staff it with a bunch of people. And sometimes it's people who say, Hey, sign me up. I want in. But a lot of other times it's almost that like super successful project group, right? Jason, uh, Chris and Drew are, have, are known for getting stuff done. So we're going to treat this like a project and we're going to stick these people in that role. Mm -hmm. um, is that almost, is that almost a, a death knell before it gets out the gate? Like what, how do you, what's been your experience with that? And if that is, if that is somewhere where someone finds itself, how do they get the, get the ship? How do they write the ship mm -hmm. to get the best results out of that? Uh, to have a conversation around the, the, the voluntold aspect, which we did <laughs> with this global uh, change. Cause when I did the two day liftoff with them, um, you could tell people were there because they were, they were assigned because of influence and, and authority. You just know when you're facilitating, you can kind of get that vibe. So I just said, this is what I see. Is this true? It just seems like there's people here that you, you doesn't seem like you really want to be here and you're tolerating it. So did you guys have a choice? And the answer was not everyone. So lesson number one was uh, nominate people, but allow them to opt out. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, because that's, the- that's been my experience is yeah. that most in most companies, they take the dregs. In fact, I've talked to transformation team members in other organizations and they said, when I got asked to do this, they, they thought, are you, are you trying to like riff me? Like, is this your way of like firing me? <laughs> No, I think many people. Mervin just people, called me the dregs. Thanks, buddy. No, I'm not saying. Yeah, I said in some organizations because in in some organizations, like if if it's like they don't have a transformation team, you were already in this position of doing stuff and, and head in this direction, so it made sense for you. So way to make it about you, Jay. Right? When I wasn't even talking about you, you selfish prick. Right? But if but. Often organizations, they take the dread, like people that nobody want and they go, oh, let's, let's stick them on this transformation team. That, that really has to feel awful wow. when, you, when you find that out, right? It's terrible. This is, uh, uh, it's been the opposite for me. It's been authoritarian, uh, who can get this thing under control attitude. Or wow. the, other, the, okay. other pat- the other pattern is when it's people who are, when there's too many people I've seen this in three occasions where the whole transformation team is very strong left side manifesto and curious, passionate, extremely positive intent on what they're trying to do. And they run so fast that it disrupts the team boundaries in the organization. And then the top leadership says, we need a manager to sit on top of this group. Now they're out of control. Uh, and, yep. and, and I've seen three full teams quit within a year. That, yeah, that's my that experience fatigue. every time. That's my experience yeah, that every fatigue. time. Yeah, the organization will never go as fast as our personal change experience does, especially in the enterprise. So we need we need a balance of both. We need a voice of reason. We need the disruptors. We need the creative people. We need the data analysts. We need the people with good relationship skills. And no one person can have all of that. So we need a good balance across the hierarchy. Just the same way you would put together a cross-functional agile team, a cross-functional transformation team that does things like, you know, when I would exit teams, we do an exit interview. Rate how effective it was having a coach from zero to 10 and why. Rate the effectiveness of your coach from zero to 10 and a comment why. And what do you wish we would have done and what's next? And that's it. And it's public data for everybody to see. So instead of, hey, let's measure the velocity of the team to see if the coach is doing a good job, let's ask the team if it was a good experience because you can't, I've had four personal coaches in my career and I could not quantify how to measure that other than all of those experiences were awesome. Even if I got one tiny thing out of it, it led to something bigger down the road. But we get locked into this measurement of how do we measure the coaches? Mm. So, oh, uh, and so I, I'm going to toss that to left in a second, <laughs> talking about measuring coaches. Um, but real, real quick, what I want to say to your point of like the uh, uh, thinkers, right? The the aspirational thinkers needing some sort of oversight and rational thinking. You you give you you give any of the anybody the learning that we've experienced, right? You open their eyes to what the left side does right you give whether it's through a framework whether it's through a conference whether it's through whatever you give them just a taste of that and all of a sudden they're like oh my gosh i want the whole organization to drink from this fire hose because this is amazing and then they hold that fire hose to everybody and they say ready and then Mm -hmm. there's like it, it makes sense to have a manager to say hold on like let's give them a little bit right we can if we give them too much Right, we're gonna chase them away, and they're gonna, you know, and everybody's like, "But no, 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 it's really, really great." Like, let me just tell you about this. There's these nine principles, and then whatever, right? And 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 you get going. But that I, I totally get that. Mm-hmm. Back back to Andrew. Um, Andrew, what's it like to be measured as a coach? Well, it depends on who's measuring and what checklist they're using. So I have a, <laughs> and you know, I'm more of a kind of a cerebral kind of coach so i when i put together a a coaching um sheet to not rate coaches but just to see where you are i mean i i very much look at it as does my coach care for me and this is one of my coaching mentors that kind of instilled this technique with me and it's worked well it's you know can i trust my coach Mm -hmm. do i do i have you know 
are they really invested? Are they selfless? Are they, you know, and then your own coaching, you know, kind of compass as far as do I check my emotions? Do I regularly suspend my judgment? You know, How do I, I show practice? up for them? Yeah. So I think that that to me is, I don't know how, what metrics companies think they can use to rate coaches because velocity is, you know, it's just a math problem. Mm. So I, to me, it's, <laughs> it's, it's silly. I mean, it's just, it's not, I'm, Kusak mm -hmm. says this all the time. If I'm coaching a football team, I'm not running on the field taking snaps, right? Like I expect, these are the expectations that I have of the people that I'm coaching. And these are the expectations that I want to know that they have of me as their coach. Mm -hmm. So it's clear. It's, it's, it's a, it's a level playing field. A lot of it's feel. It's, yeah. it's not, it's not quantifiable. It's, it's just, uh, I, I had one, I actually, one interview, an organization asked me, how, how are we going to measure your effectiveness as the coach or the change agent? And I said, why don't in the lobby, you put up a big sign, how much you're paying me and have people <laughs> say from zero to 10, if they're getting their money's worth. <laughs> and, that's, and I told, I wish they would have did it. Cause that would be such an awesome picture to show. But, um, what about a, what about a picture of you that just says we'll coach for tips? Yeah. Yeah. And, and like a bucket. Yeah. And, and, uh, you're, you're like a, you're like a painted statue, except yeah. you've got really long, like your hockey hairdo. Yeah. Like you're in, you're in an Oilers Jersey and you're like, yeah. So, so yeah. I have a question for Jason. I know ostensibly yeah. we wanted to talk about the transformation office, right? But I, I wanted to ask you, Jason, what are your thoughts on this? I came across a quote, I think it was by Simon Wardley. He of Wardley Mapping, and it was on Twitter the other day. And it was a, he posted, it was a back and forth conversation between him and someone else. And he made the remark that um, when you step into an organization, you're trying to introduce a change, especially a massive change like an agile transformation. His, mm -hmm. his remark was, you've got 90 days. You've got 90 days to make an efficient change. And then and his exact words were something along the lines of, then the antibodies will start to reject you and start mm -hmm. to, the organizational yep. antibodies. Yep. Do, what are your thoughts on that? Like, is that an accurate statement? Like, do you really got to get in and move quick? Um, and if so, how do we how do we prevent those antibodies from actually taking us down before we even get a chance to mm. get some get some rocks over the hill? Yes, I I, I agree with that completely. Which is uh, one of the reasons why I stopped doing any long term consulting stuff a long time ago. Mm. It's bursts. It's uh, help them uh, make sense of their current environment and what road they want to go down. So do you know what you're in for? Are you willing to accept the things that we can't anticipate right now? Here's a bunch of stories, here's a bunch of experience, but all this type of stuff. If you want to do it, let's do it. So for me, the 90 days plus the idea of intervening at the right rituals. You know, a lot of companies that do annual budgeting and planning, if they do that in August or September timeframe for all of the next uh, year, October is a horrible time to start a transformation because there's way too much inertia already. Mm, You're mm. never going to overcome that. So it's pointless to start. Uh, it's the same thing with the 90 days. You're going to know if the system is ready to change within that time period. And if you don't, number one is the coach, you get sucked into their reality. So you are now inside the box mm -hmm. and, and you start to do what, you know, I, I was in this one organization, they had five layers of hierarchy in their agile COE. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, and, I'm watching I'm watching Mervin just sort of yeah. twitch in the in they, the video. <laughs> they, Jesus Christ. <laughs> they just they they took on the sh the the shape of the existing organizational pattern. So if you're there for a longer period of time, the more likely you're going to get uh, uh, you know sucked into the board collective if you will. Yeah, Agile Uprisers, uh, see our podcast on hierarchy within Agile coaching for more about this topic. We we went extensively down this road of like, what is a team coach versus a program coach? Yeah. What is an enterprise coach? And and the different like uh, prestige that's involved with those sorts of things, which doesn't really matter a hill of beans in the end. Um, okay, so transformation offices, right? So we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're still going on the path. Right. We talked about, you talked about a little bit, Jason, but like why, like it's great having, so it's great to have them ground you in, okay, here's your theory. Here's your principles made realistic with this organization. Here's what this organization is capable of right now. That's the mm -hmm. value of them. Right. But they can really 
like stunt a lot of the work that we try to do, what are, what's your experience been about how they get in the way? How transformation teams get in the way? Yeah, yeah. How, how, do, they, how do they make it harder? Uh, one thing I've seen is they add more process and stuff for programs and teams to do without taking existing stuff away because they're a bolt-on department. There's probably already a, uh, multiple PMOs, potentially, and an enterprise PMO, and a process improvement team, and an innovation team, and now an agile team. And you've got all these different groups that are doing, working in similar spaces that are all colliding with each other. And they get locked into the same pattern as the others. We're spending $3 million a year on this transformation office. Where's the evidence that I'm getting my $3 million worth? And that evidence is usually, here's how many teams we've lifted off. Here's how many blah, blah, blah. Here's how many people have gone through our agile waterboarding training. And blah, blah, blah. <laughs> there may be a market for that, Jason. You might want to <laughs> trademark that. Yeah, I was about to say, is that a framework I smell cooking? Yes, <laughs> yes. I stole it from John Stahl, so. <laughs> yeah. So the, the pattern falls very much in line if you, uh, this is something to Google afterwards, but the, the work of uh, Herbert Bloomer, who uh, pioneered the work in social change theory, whereas when there's a change in a system, the first stage is emergence, where there's a lot of uncertainty. People are upset with how things work. So somebody does something and change starts to happen, but it's emergent. It's not structured. It's very chaotic lots of uncertainty, we don't know exactly where we're going, and then we get to a certain point where we feel we need more structure, and we start to coalesce, which is the second stage. So we put a little bit of structure in place so it doesn't feel so painful. Then the third stage, if we, if we take that too far, we go to bureaucratization, and we try to institutionalize what we were trying to do in the first place, which leads to the fourth stage, which is decline. Mm -hmm. So the, the pattern of what I see with transformation teams is they one of the one of the substages of decline is co-optation, which is basically we used our old values of the organization to try to transform to a new state. So if our old values were command and control, we use the same command and control values to build our change team or our transformation team. We held them to the same processes and the same operating models and mental models as the old world. So we get the same result. So some, somewhere in that coalescence bureaucratization curve is when we have a choice. That's the 90-day window. We have lots of chaos. We've done lots of experiments. We've tried some things. Um, one telecom I worked for, we did uh, what was called a mini Big Bang. And 10 teams started. We went from zero to 200 teams in two years. So many teams went agile, it made it impossible for the ops teams to keep up. That's the jump from coalescence to bureaucratization because that's your organization telling you that you should not have a centralized ops team. They should be merged into the teams and you should now switch to value streams for stacks. That's a natural transition to an agile organization. They went the opposite. Well, screw this. We're going to make it harder for teams to release because we can't keep up with all these processes. <laughs> Which I'm sure meant that no backdooring happened or no drive-bys, like none of those ever happened, right? Oh, they, they would still happen, but you can understand it. I mean, if you're, <laughs> if, you're, if you're in that centralized group and you're used to a lockstep, you know, release train kind of schedule, and now you're getting bombarded with so many packages every week and you don't have the people to, to manage that, yeah. your only defense is control in those organizations unless you choose to have a different conversation about how we're structured. But we don't have time for that. We got commitments for these releases. They got to get out the door. We'll do it next quarter. Those are the periods where we shift into co-optation. If we don't consciously say, somebody at the top says, you know what? Screw half of our releases. We're pushing them all to the next quarter. Let's figure this out because they're putting their neck on the line. It's, you know, the, all this stuff is a lot more complicated than, than we think. And it's all system dynamics and it's all people relationships and it's all humans love the easy answer because you, well, you guys know what it's like being a coach. It's fucking exhausting because you're <laughs> on all the time. 
yeah. then you can't go on autopilot because that's not the job description. That's a Lef, great you, point. Had a, you had a question, Lef. What was your question? Yeah, so one of the things that just popped into my head, I'd be curious, and as you talk about you know, these, these relationships and people, Jason, in your experience, working with Agile Transformation offices, and, and I've worked with a fair share myself, have you experienced when someone is leading up the, that Agile Transformation office that comes from internal, you know, part of the organization, right? Do they fall victim of being, you know, a result of the system that they, they work in and their culture? Or do you see it being more beneficial coming in from the outside that you don't have the emotional baggage that the organization has, you know, you haven't learned it yet? Hmm. It's, it's the combination of both is where I've seen it work the most. I've worked in some where the internal, you know, sponsoring SVP is known for being highly disruptive anyway. So it's no problem for that person to go in and shake things up. Um, I think, uh, I think the, the balance of having an external perspective helps whoever the internal people are. Uh, I worked with one team where it was the, uh, the VP of operations was their, their sponsor for the transformation. And she was very conservative, but super, super smart. She took all the emotion out of pretty much everything and she just needed a different perspective and data and she'd make the right choice. It was always usually more of a conservative choice, but I think the, the, the balance of somebody that knows the culture and if they're presented with options they wouldn't have thought of before, they now can ch consciously choose to swim against the cultural norms or decide now is not the right time for option X. I'm going to take option A instead for now because they know the political environment. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. Sorry, Jay. Just one more final thought around that is, I often think that hearing you talk through that, the balance, right? I almost mm -hmm. feel like that's that's like the coaching gift. You have to be able to find the balance within the organization and get people to understand what that even means, mm -hmm. so you can a approach things differently. So I, mm -hmm. I love the way you you phrase that. Organizational that's physics it. trademark. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, I, I've seen. I know I've seen it somewhere. Um, oh shit! I gotta go register that domain. <laughs> it, it makes le, left. You just made me think of. I, I think I wrote. I wrote a blog post ages ago, years ago. I think when we first started talking about. It, I think I called it Cerberus, right? So um, my thought was, in any type of transformation like this, especially when it comes to massive organizational change, you need an inst internal champion, you need an external champion, and then you need an executive champion. I think that was my theory. My theory. Right, you need someone internally who has the organizational organizational cachet, who has the reputation, you know, the the that can say, okay, look, this is what we want to do, and I, I'm going to have to live whatever we whatever with whatever we suggest. You need an external expert to come in and say, well, here's how in a neutral, you know, in academic application, here's what you'd see. But then you also, I thought, my thought was, I forgot why I originally read this. You want an executive change person. You want someone from the top down saying, hey. This is really somewhere we want to march towards. I know it's not going to be fun, but let's let's do it. Yeah, yeah. and and it, it, something you just said too, Jay. And I, I'd be curious if does the size matter? Well, well, sorry, I can't believe I just said that out loud. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, all people just don't like change. You know, it's it's a mm -hmm. it's a resistor. It's people are resistant to it. So what could be small in the grand scheme of things could be actually a very big impact to a person or a group of people. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's kind of misleading. Like what's, how do you size it? Change has changed uh, to me. Maybe I'm thinking I too simple. I, I don't know that I, I, I've experienced, I don't know, Jason, about you, but I, I've, I've experienced change in so many different, like I've experienced change within a 50 person org and in a hundred and, and now working in like a 2000 person org, like there, it, it's kind of the same thing. Just, the like the good and the bad scale like relatively it you know equally right mm -hmm. yeah i don't know well, it's, i think uh, it's the same yeah if they just think net, network nodes the same way you would manage dependencies on a 2000 person program you're you're managing um where those networks are intersecting with each other so small autonomous trans transformation teams in various departments or product lines, if you will, 
And when they have to step out of bounds into someone else's territory, the link is important to manage. I mean, there's, there's only four elements of organizational design that are as old as dirt, and it's how we have people organized by function, by geography, by product, by region, by whatever. Second one is how are we linking them together when they need to coordinate through projects, through uh, physical location, through tools that we use, et cetera. Three, how do we align them towards a common purpose? And four, is it working? If you strip mm -hmm. away all the process models and all the magic that's you know coming out of different certifications, those four things is organizational design. And we don't, we need, well, I shouldn't say we need, having a support transformation office, that's like the air traffic control tower that helps, you know, the transformation sub team that's working with the baggage handlers and the ticket counter and the pilots know what's going on all the way around. So, Hey, you know what, uh, you guys over here in it in Prague, you don't have to reinvent whatever, go talk to these people in Australia. They've already done it and they can help you out with it. That's a function, a supporting function of a central um, transformation office that that could scale infinitely because you you don't need these two different regions or programs to work exactly the same. Um, but you can help each other out, knowing full well that there. How many times have you guys been in organizations where, you know, a year later they've said, "Hey, you know what? We should really try this thing," and it's an idea you talked about a year ago. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. They, yeah. have, they have to go through it and live it. Tesla is a great example. People rag on them all the time because manufacturing is a solved problem. How can these idiots have such a hard time with it? Because they haven't done it before. It doesn't, right. All the theory doesn't matter when right. you actually get your hands in the dirt. So if that group on top is a, is a support structure that follows a similar metaphor to the air traffic controller, I think it shapes the approach of change a bit differently. I love it. Um, so we're hitting the 60 minute mark. So I'm going to land this plane with one last question. So we talked about the, the air traffic controller plane, right? The mm -hmm. air traffic controller tower kind of looking over everything, watching everything. Um, so what I'll ask Jason and then I'll ask Andrew and Jay and, and myself, and then we'll close out. What, what do those transformational offices need? to be successful. I know you can just say it in like five words and it'll blow minds and then we'll just run, run and, 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 you know, snag those URLs itself. Um, the, I'll say the first thought came into my brain. It went right to courage to have the conversation around expectations and the congruence to not compromise your own needs as the people who are in that transformation office just for the sake of placating. Wow. I love it. Jay, you're up next. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bootstrap off of Jason's. I think along with that courage, if you're going to create a transformation office and you're going to staff it with very smart people who are interested in the change, I think they need to be visibly empowered. And that message needs to come down that, look, we are trusting our future in the hands of these people please give them the respect and empower them because otherwise they're just yelling into the wind. S says the person that's yelling into the wind a lot. Of yeah. Time. yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> are you, are you, do you feel like you're properly empowered right now where you're at in your transformation? Jay? Um, I think we are. I mean, I really think there's what we say, like, you know, a lot of the things Jason said were, are rattling around in my head. Like, cause I'm trying, we're always trying to figure out, am I doing that? Are we doing that? No, I think we are empowered. I think everybody does give us an ear and give us a list. Um, granted we're, we're multi years in. So I think we've, we've earned that cachet. Um, if I had to speculate on my current spot and where I think we could go a little better, I think a stronger top down message would be very helpful just to consistently reiterate. Right. I mean, it's hard for me to tell my peers, look, we really should do this. It's the best way to do it. And I can go through every sales pitch and change thing I know, but there are some people who are truly only motivated by the stick coming down from the top of the totem pole. And I think yeah. that's where just a strong message of, Hey, this is for all of us. I need you bought in. I think would, would help. But yeah, I'm, I feel pretty empowered. A lot of the things I say, you know, I think get listened to. 
<laughs> it's because you're scary. It's because you're yeah. big and scary. <laughs> yeah, could be. Uh, Andrew Leff, what about you? What do transformation offices need to be successful? Uh, I think to me, they need to inspire the organization, not just to, to do things different, but to behave and be different, right? So for, to enable people to be different, not just do telling them to do something or their process differently. So to me, process is process. So if, yeah. if the emotion is still negative, they carry that through. So that's where I see it. Them having a, a inter, integral part in it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm with you. Balancing process with reality. Um, you didn't quite say it that way, but I think that so often we we learn something and we think that what we learned is if i just tell people the thing that i learned it makes sense to us right these these change agents you they learn something and their the scales fall from their eyes and they think wow this is so simple let's just do this and they think telling people is going to make change happen and so my I guess if I could give any advice to transformation office is that telling isn't change, right? Like sharing information, you know, sharing slides, doing a, doing a lunch and learn, right? Doing a webinar, um, you know, whatever it is, telling's not, telling is not change. And you gotta, to, you know, to, to quote our guests, like you gotta live it, right? You gotta you gotta live it for a little bit and then see what happens, so to speak. Um, so, Jason, you're you're uh, you're writing a sequel to your book that you told me via email, right? So, mm -hmm. what's that or via Twitter? What's that process been like? What's that process been like going down this path once again of change? Uh, this one's been harder because it's based on the last, uh, I guess, almost now six years of data collected from. Uh, workshops all over the world and visiting various different companies around five uh, five aspects that were the most important for change agents no matter if they were agile coaches change managers hr people whatever there were kind of five universals that um, help us move change forward and the key is in how you as a person looks through those five dimensions and chooses to use the models and tools that are out there in, in drastically different ways. So you can think of it as a puzzle is kind of the or, general idea. Well, I was thinking, I was thinking the five hockey sticks of change, right? Is yes. that, Ooh, is that, a, that might be better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. I just, it just dawned on me. You have a Carolina hurricanes t-shirt on right now. Is that, yep. are you betraying, are you betraying your country right now? No, the Oilers have been playing crappy the last few days and Carolina beat them in the Stanley cup in 2006. <laughs> so I thought if I, if I wore the opposite shirt, it would inspire the team would get really mad at me and play well. And they were, they were beating uh, Columbus four to, four to one before we started. So it worked. <laughs> So, so the message to internal transformation offices is superstition and yes. wearing the other team's colors, uh, they work, right? Yes. So just that's, if there's anything that our guests can teach you that today, it's wear the other company's colors. You'll be, yeah. you'll be, you'll be, <laughs> you'll be, you'll be great. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how else to land this plane, so I'm going to do that. Um, you just or, crashed it. Yeah, yeah, let's crash it. Let's you didn't land. No, 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 no. I, I said I landed it, damn it. You, you shut up, Andrew. You're, you're muted. Uh, for those, so for Jason Little, mm. for Andrew Love, for Jay Hirschko, uh, guys, thank you so much for the chat. This is the Agile Uprising podcast. If you, uh, if you love us, if you like what we're doing, if you even sort of want to acknowledge us as we pass in the hallways, rate us and subscribe on, on your podcast app of choice. And there's Patreon and there's the coalition and, you know, even hit us up. We've got some new, you know, we've got some new stickers that we'd love to to send you in terms of transformation. So I am Chris Merman and we are signing out. Thank you. <laughs>